Uh, if you have your Bible this morning, let's, let's open up to Luke chapter 19. We're going to look at one verse there in Luke 19 and just use that as a runway. Um, we're honored to be here. When I say we, I mean me and Stephen. Uh, we have the joy of being a part of a ministry called Burning Ones. Uh, our families are back home. Um, our wives and our multitude of children in between our two families. Uh, there are 11 kids between our two families. I have five. He has six. Uh, my little guy just turned one a couple of days ago. Uh, so I have from 12 to one, two girls, three boys, uh, and one other little girl, Ava, who we will meet on that great day when Jesus returns. Um, it's a joy to be with you guys. I don't say that out of routine. I was thinking it was just several months ago where we had the honor to participate here as well. Uh, but it's a joy to continue to come and to see what God is doing and to be able to contribute through the ministry of the word, um, to sow seed and to put an entrustment that the word works. Um, the word works. Jesus said, it is written. Other things are important, and they can have their place, and we can find traction or gain bearings with other things, but the word works. Um, dreams and, and prophetic words and, and inspiration and worship and, and all of these things, real godly counsel, and all of these things are amazing, um, but the word works, and we're a people of the word. Right? For the word came and tabernacled amongst us. The word put on flesh. Um, so it's a, a joy to be able to participate and to continue in the word with you. Uh, we love your pastors. As he said, we are a family. Uh, we are stuck with one another. God has done it, uh, and it's amazing. Um, so thank you, man. We, we love you guys. You know that. In Luke 19... We find Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. I feel as if the Lord really stirred my heart to come and to refresh the weary worshiper. The weary worshiper. As a matter of fact, as I've set myself to fast and to pray in order to be ready with you, um, I really had on my heart those that are weary in worship and those that are weary in warfare. I mean, we may have to do a part one and part two or an A and B. I don't sermonize well in the first place, so um, maybe we'll do worship in this gathering and warfare in the next. Uh, you just have to watch it online or something. Um, I just don't run it back very well, uh, meaning the, the same experience. I'm just not good at that. Um, so I really want to honor and be faithful to what I feel like the Lord has put in my heart. And I feel like uh, for our time together, the Lord wanted me to come and speak into the conversation of the weary worshiper. And this is one of the items that we find in the triumphant entry in Luke 19. Right? The triumphant entry is going to be in all four Gospels. You're going to find it in Matthew 21. You're going to find it in Mark 11. You're going to find it in Luke 19. You're going to find it in John 12. That's not Bible scholar stuff. You could Google that. Um, but in Luke 19, we find an ingredient that Luke includes that's not found in the other accounts. And by triumphant entry, we mean Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem. He's already worked signs and wonders. He's raised the dead. He's multiplied food. He's opened the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf. He's done extraordinary wonders in the midst of the people. He's also rebuked Pharisees. <laughs> He's also preached on the mount of the attitudes of the kingdom, our real transformation into the image of God's own son, the one that he loves and honors, upon which one day he will hand over a kingdom that will be without end. He will evict sin, destroy the works of the wicked one, and will bring us into an ultimate sense of salvation. An ultimate sense, meaning everything from within the created order that is resisting God's love and leadership will be removed. It's why God's judgments are righteous. 
It's why he will be glorified even in his judgments, because his judgments are unto a greater revealing of his goodness. Meaning, God is good, and God loves and desires that his love and leadership would not just be on display, but that it would be deeply experienced in the lives of those that he loves. And it's why we are leaning towards an ultimate sense of salvation. An ultimate sense, meaning everything in the universe that is resisting God's love and leadership will be evicted forever. And there will be no more hurdle to the way God longs to demonstrate his loving kindness. And everything will be reconciled unto his loving obedience. Praise God. And Jesus, coming into Jerusalem, it says he descends from the Mount of Olives. And he's coming into Jerusalem. The Son of Man is once again humbling himself. And he's going lower. And God is gracious in order to give us a revelation of himself that creates a unique reference point than anything else that this world has to offer. God understands that the best thing that he can do for you and for me is to unveil himself. The best thing that we can experience is a revelation of who God is and in seeing who God is, a greater understanding of what God is. When it says, at the name of Jesus, demons tremble and demonic powers bow, It's not just because Jesus is a greater name than Bob or Joe or Jimmy or Jack. It's not because God created a hopper and Jesus popped out as a name and he just chose that name as a name only or as a title to be better than every other name. That's not the situation. When it references the name, the name is a correlation to the substance. It's the character. It's his makeup. It's what he's actually put together with. It's the real guts of who somebody is. The name Jesus. When he says, the enemy has come in John 14, 30, but I am not afraid for he has nothing in me. It's a reference to his own name, his state of being. His stature, the substance that he realizes is his actual DNA. In his makeup, there is no thing that the enemy can say is a thing that looks like him, behaves like him. There's no ingredient in the life of Jesus that anyone else can lay claim to except God himself. And so at the name of Jesus because of the substance, the quality of character, the power of his DNA and makeup, demons tremble because you're nothing like us. You're nothing like us. And we find this all throughout the gospel that there was a recognition from demons themselves when they came upon the Son of God. There was a response In many instances, it's at some points comical. In many instances, demons understood in a way better way who Jesus was than at times the crowds who were gathered around. There was a more authentic response to the person of Jesus from the realm of darkness than it was those whom God in the man Jesus had come to give himself to. But in Luke 19, we find a different scenario. It says that as Jesus is descending from the Mount of Olives, we understand the prophetic implications here. Zechariah 9.9, for behold, your king comes to you. I love it in the NASB. It begins with rejoice greatly, for your king comes to you, humble, riding on a donkey, endowed with power and salvation. Coming to restore God's desires. So they understand the prophetic implications. And once again, we find the Son of Man lowering himself. Paul tells us in Philippians 2 
that God humbled himself to become a man. And that wasn't low enough. So even as a man, he humbled himself to become a servant. And that wasn't low enough. So he continued to descend. And then even as a servant, he humbled himself once again and chose to joyfully lay down his life. And that wasn't humble enough. That wasn't low enough. So he descended once again and chose the most humiliating public death that anyone could possibly experience. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2 that this is the wisdom that even the rulers of the age could not handle. That God would willingly and joyfully choose to lay down his life. But this is the wisdom of his cross. That God would take upon himself the punishment for the sins that were being created against him. Who is this king of glory? The psalmist writes. Who are you, Lord? Is what was continually asked of those to whom God chose to reveal himself to. Who are you, Lord? Who is this king of glory? Whose wisdom is I will joyfully be murdered in order to benefit your life. I will joyfully be executed, publicly humiliated, in order that my life would become an offering to reconcile your life and the corruption and the hostility found in the created order against my love and leadership. I will go for us. For we understand Jesus is the man who answers the cry of Isaiah 6. Who will go for us? It's Jesus. Isaiah just gives us a glimpse of the man who would fulfill Isaiah's imperfect desire. For all throughout the scripture, we get an imperfect glimpse of this perfect man. Abel, the righteous shepherd, who offers his life through being murdered by the jealousy of brothers because of his unblemished offering in the way that he walks before God. Can you see Jesus? Enoch, the man whose walk is so pleasing to God that God comes to get him. And we understand through the life of Enoch that God is able to preserve us from having to face death. But we understand in the man Jesus that God is able to raise us on the other side of having to experience death. For Jesus is the more perfect Joseph though falsely accused, though sold out by his brothers, though he has a dream of being exalted in the midst of them, pushed into the prison of a Gentile palace, though he's raised to the right hand and is unveiled through a Gentile land to feed his brothers in a season of famine, inviting Israel to jealousy Finding food in a Gentile situation. It's a prophetic glimpse of the end of the age. When the nations will rage against Israel and the Gentiles will provoke them to jealousy by the way that they feed them and house them in a season of life that is the most hostile that the world has ever known. But Jesus is the better Joseph. And all throughout the history of the scripture, we get a glimpse of this man who is constantly longing to unveil himself to us in order to create a reference point to get the response from us that he deserves. And this is what we find in Luke 19. It says that as Jesus descends from the Mount of Olives in Luke 19, 37, it says that the crowd gathered round that day burst forth with exuberant joy and worship. I would suggest to you that a revelation of who God is should bring us to the place where it produces worship in our life. That we don't worship him out of information, but we worship him out of revelation. You can study him all day long, but until you see him, you will not worship him. You can try to research him, but that's why research alone will never produce a revelation of who God is. 
because it is not your initiative nor your demand that produces God's desire to reveal himself to you. God can be researched, but he must be revealed in order for us to see him. Because it's by his own choosing that he draws near. It's by his own desire that he lifts the veil so that we can actually begin to see. For the Lord is my light and my salvation. God alone is the source of light and life. And it is in his desire for him to be known that he chooses to give us a revelation of himself. You cannot produce a revolution or a revelation of God. None of us. No man or woman in this room, in the universe for that matter, can demand that God reveal himself. You can't fast enough. You can't pray enough. You can't worship enough in order for your devotional efforts to put enough of a demand where God be subject to your devotional desires. In order for him to do something that he already has decided he does not want to do. None of us can make God do something he has already determined he's not going to do. And it's why we have to understand the implications of God drawing near and choosing to reveal himself. Now that's not to say that we don't give ourselves to a life of devotion. We absolutely do. But we have to understand that God is not subject to us. We are subject to him. Because if God was subjected to us, then we would be God and he would not be. But it's his own desire. It's his own longing. It's his own drive and passion to be known. I would submit to you that God longs to be known. He longs to be known. It's why he chooses to reveal himself. It's why he's gracious enough to give us a glimpse of who he actually is and what he actually is. Because God himself understands that the best possible thing for you is for you to be able to see him. Right? Jesus said it best. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm humble. First off, who says something like that? He says, come and learn from me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I will give you rest for your weary souls. To simply put it, the best thing you could do is to get close to me and see me and learn from me. And I understand that that's the best thing for you. And so my desire is to draw near to you and reveal myself to you so that you can see something other than the things that you've always seen, which will give you a, a reference point to worship something other than the things you've always worshipped. Because until God gives us a reference point of something that is more worthy to be worshipped, we are bound distributing or displaying our affection to things that are lesser in their value. And so God says, I'm going to destroy the way that you worship yourself by giving you a revelation of who I am. Because we were all created to worship. Worship is not necessarily a choice. It's an inherent desire to demonstrate our affection, to have an object of our attention and affection. And we see people that worship every single day. For some of us, it's a career path. For others, it's a financial stature. For some, it's extracurricular activities. Have you ever seen somebody rooting for their favorite sports team? It's comical at times that the amount of passion that can be locked up in a person, that when the right object arrives, that gives us the reference point to be able to demonstrate all of what we're feeling on the inside towards the thing that we've determined is worth 
such display. It's comical at some times. The extremes that people are willing to go in order to display the passion that is locked up on the inside. And God understands that we are a passionate people. And at times it just takes a little bit of time or effort to try to figure out what it is in a person that just gets them going, right? Because for some, it's different than others. And I get it. It's not, it's not like a one size fits all or like a blanket application. It's not universal in nature where we're all necessarily passionate about the same things. But when you find the thing, Thing that does it for that person at times it is wild to see the amount of devotion that's locked up on the inside when someone determines that a particular object is worth it and it's why God understands that he is gracious enough to give us a reference point other than the things that we find in this world or the thing that we find in the mirror The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, which is 1 John 2, which is all of the complications in Genesis 2 in the garden situation. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life that brought them to compromise. Where they were overcome, the man Jesus overcomes. In his three temptations in Matthew 4, it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Jesus is able to manage his appetites where Esau was not. He's able to remain or to sustain the birthright rather than choosing to compromise as Esau did from a hunger and a place of passion that was mismanaged. But God is gracious to show us something that is so astounding that it brings us to a place where we are willing to reorient and bring adjustments to the display of our attention and affection. And in that, we would call that worship. And so they see this man, this humble king, coming down the Mount of Olives. And it says that they joyfully erupt. And that their response at seeing him is worship. Is your response to seeing him a joyful eruption? Or have you grown weary in the place of worship? If you've grown weary in the place of worship, then I would suggest that you've grown dim in the place of seeing. Because it is impossible to see him rightly and not respond to him rightly. And that's why worship is about Jesus and it's not about you and me. Let, let, me, let me continue down this path just a little bit. Worship is not about you and me. Worship is not an accompaniment to an order of service. Worship is not some 10, 20, 30, or 40 minute slot that we plug in on a Sunday so that we can say we went to worship. Worship is not a vibe. It's not an atmosphere. Worship is not a performance. It's not an industry. Worship is not a record label. Worship isn't even necessarily instruments or a song. Worship is not fundamentally Lyrics alone. Worship is the rightful response to a man who gives a revelation of himself that provokes a response that is the only response that we can say is right. And as Jesus is coming down the mount, being crushed in the place of obedience, yet delighting to do his Father's will, worship or the implications of worship that we most often find throughout the scriptures is surrender. And worship is more about surrender than it is about songs. Because you can sing songs and not be surrendered. 
Just because you sing songs doesn't mean that you're surrendered. Because most of us sing lyrics that we don't live. But worship is living the lyrics. Because though you can sing songs and not be surrendered, I don't think you can be surrendered and not sing songs. Because there's a song that rises out of surrender. Psalm 119.7, the psalmist writes, I will sing songs to you or I will joyfully lift my voice with shouts of praise to you when I learn your righteous judgments. Being crushed under the leadership of Jesus. And let's not assume or try to play games that following Jesus is always easy. Let's not try to pretend that Jesus' leadership in my life is always going to bring me to skip through the fields and to frolic through the tulips. The first instance of worship in the scriptures is Genesis 22. And it's a man being crushed under the weight of the word of the Lord. The leadership of God in his life has requested something of him and invited him into a place of obedience that is so beyond the power of what he knows he actually is able to produce. It's Abram with his only son, as God references him, Isaac. Bring the boy to the mount and offer him to me. Abram gets up early the next morning. First off, I've got five kids. I don't know if I'm getting up early the next morning. Abram gets up early the next morning and he ventures off to the mount that God is going to show him. When he gets to the bottom of the mount, Genesis 22, 5, he tells those that are with him, stay here. Me and the boy are going to the top of the mount to worship. No lights, camera, action. No instruments. No crowd rallied around. It's between me and God. I am being devastated by his leadership. He is asking me for obedience that I don't have the power to produce. And this is the peculiar place that Abram defines as worship. Where he creates an altar to God in the place of his surrender and the offering of his sacrifice. Where living the lyrics means more to Abram than memorizing them. where I don't want to sing songs, where I don't actually live the lyrics, but I cannot be surrendered and living in constant sacrifice without you putting a new song in my mouth. A praise to my God. When you found me in the miry clay and the devastation of the pit and you laid hold of me and raised me up, you put a new song in my mouth. So the first instance of worship is a man troubled by the way that God has revealed himself to him, yet choosing that what he has seen is deserving of the devotion that is being desired. Have you come to the determination that God is worthy of whatever he asks you for? Have you seen something in God? that has brought you across a threshold where you have said from within yourself, there is a resolve, a Daniel 1.8 resolve. Daniel resolved not to defile himself. There was an intentional counting of the cost and the consequence of giving the devotion to the God that chose to reveal himself to me. Have you actually come to a place where you have resolved that whatever he says, he's worthy of it? He's worthy of every yes that he desires. Well, which yes? How do I know what yes? I'm so, every yes. Every single yes. No matter how small, how large, how do we even scale those things in the first place? Things that are little to us are magnificent to God. Things that we think are a big deal are little insignificant things to him. Every yes. And when they see this man coming down the mount, they erupt in a joyful 
worshipful response. Because God alone is deserving of worship. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, the writer of Hebrews tells us. He references himself in Revelation 1, the one who is and was and is to come. In John 8, 58, he tells them when they're questioning him, before Abram was, I am. Because God is. And because God is, he can be trusted. Because God is, he can be worshipped. What I mean by that is God is, which means he is not changing. There's nothing else for him to be. There's nothing else that he desires to become. What he is, he is entirely secure being and wholly satisfied being beautifully consistent in what he knows he is. That means he's not changing. The same yesterday, today, and forever means that what he was yesterday, he's still going to be today. And what he was yesterday and is today, he is going to be forever. Because what he is, he is. And it's why he alone is worthy and able to handle unending attention and affection. God alone can be trusted to be worshipped. As a matter of fact, God is the only being or person or thing in the universe that can be trusted to be worshipped 24-7 and in the place of eternity. Day and night, night and day. When we get the glimpse in Ezekiel 1 into the heavens, there's a throne. For wherever you find the throne, you find worship. In part because you can't separate the ideas of worship and government. In Isaiah 6, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up, seated on a throne, and there was heavenly host gathered round in worship. In Revelation 4, and immediately after John heard the voice and the door opened, come up here, immediately I was in the spirit and taken into a heavenly vision, and I saw a throne, John says. And gathered round the throne are elders who cast their crowns, creatures who cry holy, 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 angels in unending adoration, praise, and worship. Wherever you find this worthy man, you find his throne. And wherever you find this worthy man and his throne, you find worship. Because you can't separate worship and government. Because those that are surrendered are those that can be trusted. You cannot display authority until you are surrendered to authority. The centurion tells Jesus, I recognize you are a man under authority. Because I too am a man under authority. I tell this one to go, and he goes, and this one to do this, and he does, and he does this. He says, so I recognize you too are a man under authority. You cannot wield authority that you have not first yielded to authority. You don't get to dodge God's authority and then wield God's authority. But wherever you find this man, you find worship. Because he's the only one that can actually handle it. He's unchanging. As a matter of fact, God is the only one that can be worshipped and still be himself. (laughs) We can't handle being worshipped. We weren't created with the capacity to handle being worshipped. You can't handle being worshipped Why? Because it changes who you are. Look at Hollywood. Look at the music industry. Look at celebrity Christianity. You can't handle being worshipped, but God can. God is the only person that can be worshipped 
non-stop or unending and still beautifully consistently be himself. Because he understands that worship doesn't change him. It changes us. And he's gracious enough to give us a reference point other than the things that this world has to offer. The things that have become familiar to us because they are more like us than he is. When God draws near and chooses to unveil himself, even as we have in the account of Luke 19, the great unveiling of the humble king who chooses to joyfully and willingly lay down his life to take the punishment for the sins of his enemies and executioners. This is the wisdom of this God who is humble and not anything like us. For your ways are not my ways, and your thoughts are not my thoughts. Have you ever thought to yourself, God, we're just not the same? Like, like we are not the same. Like, th there's a lot of people in, like, congested traffic that are glad that I am not God. That there are a lot of people that would have prematurely met Jesus had I had the power that God has. Because we are not the same. And we are at times, in many times, not thinking the same. The way that he says is the way is not the way that I say is the way. We just don't think alike. We don't act alike. And it's why I need to constantly see him. So that I am set free from continuing to want to be the me that I have a demand to be. Because until I see something more glorious, something more holy, something more awe-inspiring, something more wonderful, something more beautiful, until God gives me a reference point, my devotion is locked up in being directed towards lesser things. But God is gracious to set us free so that when our eyes are actually able to gain a glimpse, we finally find the one that my soul was made for. We finally find the one that is to be the object of my affection. We finally find the one who is the reference point for unending devotion. And when they see him, they erupt in joyful, exuberant. When was the last time that your response to God was marked as joyful or exuberant? It's cool. Jesus says, if they won't praise me, even the rocks will cry out. Because I know what I'm worth. Jesus is secure because he understands his own value. He understands that though the world sees him humiliated, occupying the lowest place, that he's secure enough to occupy the lowest place because he understands that his father has already exalted him to the highest place. And he understands that what he's doing doesn't have any bearing on his actual being. And he chooses to unveil himself. And those gathered around that day saw something that they had never seen. And their response was worship. Who are you, Lord? Though all-powerful, you choose to serve unto death. Though mighty, you're humble. Though righteous, you're tender and you're gentle. Though full of justice, you're full of grace and mercy. Who is this king of glory? I felt to come and to invite us to once again behold him and to see him rightly. For those of us who have been weary in the place of worship, meaning we've been weary in the place of God's leadership, 
it's been a tough season because I just haven't been able to do what I want to do. It's been a hard pathway because God has carved out a way for me that I would not have carved out for myself. He said something to me that I'm having difficulty in bearing. And as a matter of fact, the burden of the word of the Lord is crushing me. I am being broken under the word that God has given to me. And his leadership to me in this season is bridling me. This was Abram's place of worship. I've received the hardest word I've ever received in my life. And I don't really know what to do about it except bring it to God. And I'm going to try to climb up to a higher place and form an altar. And here, between just me and God, I'll give you what you're worthy of. I'll worship you with my yes, Lord. Did you realize one of the ways you worship him is with your yes? Worshippers don't carry a no. Because again, the idea of worship is a response to a revelation. And it's hard to see him as he is. And then choose my own prideful exaltation. But Abram says, I'm going to form an altar. And I'm going to give you the yes that you're worthy of. I want to encourage you, whatever yes God is asking you for in this season, he's worthy of it. We're going to close out our time together with a moment of just beholding the Lord and offering him worship. Whatever yes he's asking you for, he's worth it. Whatever painful pathway he's etched out for you. And painful not necessarily meaning physically painful. But painful to my pride. Painful to the idea of the person that I think I want to be. Painful to the arguments that I can justifiably put before God. To not have to do the things that he's asking of me or inviting me to do. Rallying agreement from others will not give us an exemption from obeying what God has said. Me and the boy will go to the top of the mount and we will worship. When they saw this humble king coming riding into the city, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They began to sing out Psalm 118, 26. In fact, which is what Jesus told the leaders of Jerusalem, I will not return to you until you cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. People are so fickle. (laughs) One day, Hosanna, Hosanna. A couple of days later, crucify him, crucify him. But why? Give us Barabbas. Barabbas, Bar, means son of. Abbas is Abba, the father. Give us the son of the father, the fugitive, the criminal, or the criminal, the one who's broken. We better identify with that man than we do that man. This man is easier to deal with. This man is easier to create exemptions for. This man is easier for me to align with because I get him. I don't understand this man. He's nothing like me. Crucify him so that I don't have to deal with him. Crucify him so that I don't have to be challenged by him anymore. Crucify him so that he can be put away from me. In the moment God reveals himself, they choose Barabbas. But it's never changed. 
in the moment God revealed himself in Exodus 19, they chose Moses. No, no, no. Give us Moses. We'll talk to him and we'll let him talk to you. I don't want anything to do with that because I can't control that. And if I give myself to that, I have no idea what's actually going to happen. I want to encourage you to give yourself to the ongoing desire of the revelation of God. To give yourself to the revelation of who God is. To give yourself to the unveiling of the person of Jesus in your heart and in your life. The intimate knowledge of God. Where I know Him and know Him for myself. And because I know Him and He has revealed Himself to me and I've been overtaken by His goodness to me, I will choose to give Him whatever yes He asked me.